according to an article written on March 1st, 2018, by Michael D. Mock, the president of the Pew Research Center. Millennials are anyone born between the ages 1981 all the way until 1996. This slightly differs from the content offered in our lessons, which goes all the way up until 2004. Either way, Millennials and Generation Z are very interesting groups. Many Millennials, such as myself, are part of the pre-internet era. We're also part of the pre-smartphone era. In fact, we're pretty much part of the pre-cell phone era in general. A few are not, however. Both groups have been through very difficult times, obviously not as difficult as those who have been through World War II or World War I, but still we have gone through a lot of various world situations, such as the Gulf War, the Afghan, the Afghanistan conflict, the Iraqi War, school shootings, conversations on diversity, globalizations, globalization in leaps and bounds due to technology. Jada Graves wrote in an article for US News how she mentioned millennials are how they're perceived and how they perceive themselves. Are we self-centered or are we hardworking? Are we needy or dedicated? Do we have unexpected work expectations or are we loyal? Susan M. Heathfield from TheBalanceCareers.com writes about how millennials embrace diversity, teamwork, have an advantage with electronic literacy, focus on results, and seek to telecommute or work remotely. The fact of the matter is millennials and even Generation Z students are quite different, and the future world requires different skills. There are uninvented jobs waiting for many of these students. How are we as educators going to prepare the students for their future if we as educators don't even know what's going on? When I was a young boy, all I had in my house was a very small TV. It was a 4x3 four by four, four by ratio versus the 16 by, 16 by 9 that we have today, the 1080p. Mine was just a very terrible TV and the greatest technology I had until I was about nine years old was a Nintendo. So it's a vastly different world nowadays. Feature skills are extremely important. According to Dr. Tony Wagner, being able to formulate this problem rather than necessarily finding the problem is a must have skill. We're in a world that calls for innovation. Furthermore, having mind skills will be required in the future labor market rather than just having skills requiring the use of hands. All those skills that require the use of hands or all those very monotonous, very automated skills that humans are going to be doing are going to be done by automated machines or they're going to be offshored. And this is in accordance with the groundbreaking book written quite a few years back actually by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat and the one I've read was The World is Flat 3.0 uh, where he talks about these different these different flatteners. This generation is very different compared to the other generation concerning its motivations. Yet we look at our education and what is it geared to? It's geared to people of past generations. This is not about education reform that we're looking at right now. These skills, these skills, this way of teaching, it's about a whole reframing of the education problem. A thought I wanted to go on with the education. If you look at history, we're going through a paradigm shift right now because you look back and thousand years ago, thousands of years ago with the Greeks and and the different students, they sought out their mentors, their scholars. And that's how they had their education in small and smaller schools. Nowadays, it's the very run-of-the-mill 
the desks are in a row, the teacher's up at front, and that's shifting too. There's no longer this focus on direct instruction and this rote memorization, at least back in the U.S. Here in China, it's still very common, but things are changing, even here in China. Now, there are different skills that need to be taught, and we've learned a lot of them throughout this course, throughout this week in particular, but the skills needed, there's seven that are needed, in fact, and this is separate from Dr. Bourne's lecture, but the seven, they kind of go hand in hand with the four C's that we learned for the skills for the 21st century. There's critical thinking and problem solving. There's collaborating across networks and leading by influence. There's agility and adaptability. Initiative and entrepreneurial spirit. This is something that the Generation Z is well known for. I just think of my little brother. He's a millennial, but he is almost Generation Z, and he he's just an entrepreneur. And the technology nowadays is allowing us to do that. Another thought that I had, even though I'm a millennial, is... Like what's out there, for example, for stock trading. Um, if I knew about this 10 years ago, I would be probably not having a job because I would have been able to invest. But I can do all this from my phone. I can learn about all this stuff from my phone. So that spirit of finding ways to make money and finding ways to make a living. Effective oral and written communication. Accessing and analyzing information. And finally, curiosity and imagination. It's important to get on top of the latest technology. We don't even know what's out there in the future. And as educators, how are we supposed to teach the children this? These skills are very important. Nana Sidibe talks about how millennials aren't as tech savvy as people think. Yes, we have our gizmos and gadgets and we have phones popping out of our pockets and we have um, iPads and we have... We have the Fitbit watches and the Apple watches that can monitor our heart rate. Our heart rate. But in an article, she mentions how 58% millennials fail to master productivity tech skills, yet they spend 35 hours per week using digital media. I have no idea what we millennials are doing unless it's keeping up with the Kardashians or thinking we're smart by watching Big Bang Theory. However, being tech savvy, according to another article, brings about four important benefits. Improved academics. As I mentioned, there's so much you can do online if you just have the curiosity. Be able to do online classes and jobs. All of us doing our online course. Able to do that anywhere, anytime. I remember when I first started doing my master's degree, I was studying classes on the subway. That was the only way I could get it done during my hour, hour and a half commute to work every morning and back home. So we can do that now. Back in the day, that could not happen. You just get a good pair of noise-canceling headphones, you slip them on, you download the video beforehand. When you're on that subway, that's what you're doing. Standing, sitting, it doesn't matter. Having a decent future career. You need to know technology to have a decent future career. There are kids that maybe they haven't gone to college anymore, but they know how to program. And, co and a lot of jobs, yes, they're looking for all the credentials, and but they want to see what you can do. They want to see the skills. They want to see that portfolio. And if you're a person who's young, who, who knows how to do these skills, maybe doesn't have that education but taught themselves, sometimes these type of people are getting hired above the the academics and those with all the diplomas and certifications. Not always the case, but knowing technology is very important. I was reading an article about the person in the office who knows how to use Excel, who knows how to make all the formulas, and everyone's asking that guy for help because that guy can make everyone's life a, a lot easier. Finally, collaboration teamwork. In Dr. Bourne, in his lecture, this week, it talks about 14 different tech skills mentioned by different researchers that students need to learn. They must know these skills. So I'm going to briefly list these off. Keyboarding skills, Microsoft Office skills, Internet skills, digital communication, hardware basics and troubleshooting, social media, online safety, producing multimedia products, computer organization, 
the ability to find apps and software, backing up data, navigating copyright laws and citing sources, using an electronic calendar, using a database. Now, when I was talking to my field educator, and you're going to see the small interview that I did with her, she offers some other insights that are not mentioned in this lecture, but were mentioned in the previous lectures. And it's about different skills that our students need to be successful in the future world, in the world that they're living in. What are they going to need? And although she briefly touches on tech skills, she also talks about some other very important elements that I think we in this current day and age really need to take to heart. So um, let's just all listen in and take care. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us, Melissa. Um, would you be able, before we begin, I didn't warn you about this, like, tell us like a brief, briefly about yourself, like your teaching uh, experience? Sure. Um, I currently, I'm working here in China at SIBS, uh, my first time teaching abroad. Um, I've been working before this for the New York City Department of Education for the past six years, um, teaching all the content and subjects. Um, from K to fifth grade, and I was also a dance teacher um, also as well in New York. I have my bachelor's degree in general and special education and my master's in bilingual and ESL. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so the first question I wanted to ask you is, how do you think a teacher should prepare their students for future employment in a global world? Um, I think this is something very important because our goal is to, once these kids leave our classroom, um, our goal is to make them succeed out in the world, right? They're not going to be in our classrooms forever. So I think it is important to teach them problem solving skills, you know, not how to solve one specific skill, but in general, if you can't solve a problem, what are some tactic skills that you can use to solve any kind of problem, any real world problem? Also, uh, making our lessons uh, relevant to them. How can you apply this to the real world? Um, you know, not only multiplying, adding, but if you go to a store or any kind of um, real life situation, it also makes them more, um, it gives them more of a want to learn when they can apply this to their to their real life and then you know from now third grade they can carry it into their future grades and slowly build upon um, their skills so that by the time they graduate and they're in 12th grade they now can be a little more prepared for you know the real world oh great and so question number two what skills should teachers be teaching their students um, as digital natives so you briefly mentioned preparing them for the real world but maybe using technology specifically what skills do you think students need and what skills do you think students lack? um i definitely do think technology is very important not only how to use an ipad but all types of technology um you know even the smart board even on a computer how to do powerpoint how to do excel you know these different computer skills that they will need how to write a resume you know i mean right now is a little early for them but middle school, they should know what a resume is, even how to write a letter, how to send out an email. Uh, these important life skills, not school skills, life skills. And then my last question, uh, how can teachers prepare students to be more adept at civil discourse uh, with disputes rather than, um, what's the word, causing polarization? but be more logical and... Um, well, I think it's very important, especially in a place like China, is to expose students to different cultures. Here, they're not exposed to different cultures because everyone around them is just like them, for the most part. Um, back home in New York, is a lot easier for these students to be culturally sensitive because they see so many cultures. They hear so many languages. They see people doing things that they don't understand and they ask, hey, why is that man kneeling over there and praying? Well, that's his, that's his religion, you know, and it's something that they see that it's a lot easier to understand when it's in your face as opposed to these Chinese students where they don't get to see these things on an everyday basis. So um, showing them videos, reading books where, you know, cultures are very different so that they understand 
a lot of times my students say things to me that are not culturally sensitive at all. You know, why do you look like that? Why is your skin darker than my skin? They call me black. You know, they, they say things not being, and they're kids, so they say these things not being culturally sensitive, but I can't get upset with them because, you know, they don't see these cultural differences all the time. So I think it's important to teach them that the world is huge, it's big, people are very different. Us as human beings, we need to learn to accept people's differences and agree to disagree, how, what that looks like, what does it mean to agree to disagree? What does that look like if me and my friend are having a disagreement? What if I go to a different country and I get into a conversation with someone um, and they say something that I don't like? What, what does that mean? Just understanding that your, your upbringing has a lot to do with the way that your um, mind works and your mentality and your beliefs, your thoughts, your morals. So just the way you were raised one way, everyone is raised a certain way. So, um, I mean, it's di a difficult topic to teach being culturally sensitive, but I think if you can start at a very young age, then it'll make it a little bit easier for them to then go out into the real world and then take these, you know, skills and put them into use. Okay. Thank you so much. There's a lot of very helpful points Melissa brought up here, and I want to briefly touch upon them, and then I want to make a concrete action plan or concrete resolution from all this that I, as a teacher, can do, and uh, fellow teachers can think about and put into action as well. The, the different skills she talked about, they need to be relevant to real-world situations. Um... I thought one thing that was very interesting, she brought up a resume. Now, how can you get a second and third grader to start working on a resume? Well, this ties in also to the uh, one of the previous classes about poverty. And the video talked about how it's important to teach people how to fill out forms. And having students think about what they want to do in the future and all the accomplishments they achieved and how to write that down in concise fashion, how to fill out forms, that's important. That's relevant for the real world um, when you're looking for a job, especially. I also liked how she talked about exposing students to different cultures and being culturally sensitive. And she got into some personal reflections on how her students deal with her in China and that's something I'm familiar with as well because China is a very homogenous society it's 90 percent Han Chinese the rest are ethnic majority the, and ethnic minorities there's 54 other ethnic minority groups in China that are part of China as well there's the foreigners that we are we're called foreigners literally Lao Wai Lao Wai means old outsider if you take it literally we are never insiders so um, culturally sensitive and that's something that it's important especially here in China because right now they're the biggest tourist group in the world they're doing business around the world and that's something we can teach the children here and as well in the states as the students are mixed with other students from diverse racial groups and I thought exposing showing videos having them read doing different activities that's going to prepare them for the future job market. Maybe not technologically wise, but that will prepare them culturally wise to engage in other cultures and be able to have that entrepreneurial spirit, one of the skills mentioned I previously mentioned. Uh, the world is huge and big. It's a big place, and nowadays we can reach out easily across the ocean without ever getting out of our chair. So I think that is something that we can take away from, from Melissa's reflections. Finally, I liked how she said we need to know how to agree to disagree. Uh, the question was about being more adept at civil discourse. And the images that we're shown on media, especially in the West and America, is, is people being violent and people arguing and yelling at each other. And... Melissa's point is we're not going to all agree. In fact, you know, we don't agree with 
even people that we agree with most things, we just, we always disagree, but knowing how to disagree is a skill that we must have. And that's not mentioned in the lesson. I, I really thought, you know, it would be good to have children watch videos to see how an argument with adults, mature adults takes place in a very civil fashion, in a logical fashion, um, taking into consideration the different cultural identities that we have. It's important to show how we can agree to disagree. So I think that is a huge takeaway. And I think one specific action that I'm going to take as an educator is um, to find ways to utilize technology to show my students cultural differences around the world. Use, using videos, finding some educational cultural games, um, reading some reading it's not as much technology obviously but finding books for my students using data a database to access and get those books so my students can find things about other cultures around the world that they're not familiar with so in the future they're prepared for the globalized world i think that is a very important skill and that is something that i as a teacher here in china should focus on with my students thank you very much